Everybody, welcome into, I guess, some version of Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. A little bit of an issue in the studio today, so we're just going to make the best of it and do what we can. Uh, really unfortunate. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about. Georgia makes a big coaching hire on Sunday, bringing in Brian McLennan as wide receivers coach. We were on with a little bit of a version of Cover 4 yesterday to kind of break some of that down, but obviously I had big plans for the show today to kind of get more in-depth into the McClendon situation. We'll do some version of that, but not the thing we'd planned on doing. Uh, either way, I'll just go ahead and warn you, I'm in an awful mood. So uh, we're going to make the best of this situation, but just go ahead and, uh, I guess, be ready for a slightly edgier version of, of BA than you might normally get. But uh, nonetheless, it is a uh, interesting day for Georgia as one of its two open coaching positions has now been filled with Brian McClendon. So in some version of our studio and some version of our conversation uh, here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, I want to go ahead and get ready to bring on John Stinchcomb here. Normally kind of a classic city logger insider update, but we'll forego all the pageantry here and just get ready to talk to uh, John uh, straight up uh, here this morning about all of this. Uh, John, welcome into the program. I uh, appreciate you uh, being here. And obviously, uh, I'm assuming that uh, Brian McClendon, some of you, you know pretty well here. So what do you make of the addition to uh, McClendon back on this Georgia staff after the uh, success that he recently had here as, or you know, previously had here as an assistant and where his career is now? Uh, first of all, good morning and thanks for being flexible with us. But what do you make of the addition to McClendon here on this coaching staff? Well, B.A., first, let me give you a lot of things to be excited about. I know you're dealing with some technical difficulty on your end, but we're still in the same month where Georgia just won a national championship. I think it's the last day we'll be able to say that until next year. So That's a good point. Uh, let's revel in it, and uh, we're ending the month on a high note. I know much was being made about, you know, possibly Heinz Ward or Terrence Edwards, even, who, you know, is a dog nation guy, um, possibly being the new receivers coach. And with the addition of McClendon, it's a former dog who's who knows the position well. And uh, it was a name that probably wasn't at the forefront of a lot of folks' minds just because of his uh, recent being, recently being named co-offensive coordinator and uh, the opportunities that, that he was pursuing elsewhere. So to get him back in the fold, I think Coach McClendon not only was a great coach when we had him. I mean, the last time we saw him as Georgia fans, he was the interim head coach and leading the dogs into a, a bowl game. So now that he's back and having the experience that he's had, um, what, what a great hire for this team. Uh, his ability to recruit, um, has, has been lauded for a number of years, but also the experience that he's got uh, at coordinating and, and developing wide receivers once they come to campus, I think is a huge feather in the cap of Georgia and expanding an already talented staff. Uh, you know, what, what I can't wait to see and what I think is, uh, is most noteworthy is how, how much in, uh, are we spending on, on a coaching staff? Because it seems to be yeah. uh, an already all-star cast that continues to expand and add great additions, and Brian McClendon is the latest. Steve Hyland in our comment section brings this up. John doing a very good job of, you know, kind of bringing it back to where it needs to be. And I didn't even really think about this, but uh, it's a really good point. This is my last day to be in the month in which Georgia won its national championship. Of course, I still wear the scarf each and every day. Uh, you know, going back to that national championship. But but after to, after today, when we show up tomorrow, hopefully we have something to show up to. But when we show up tomorrow, uh, it will no longer be the month in which UGA won the national championship. So, John, uh, thank you for finding a way to spin it positive and keep it good and uh, keep it happy. Every now and then I need a little bit of that in my life, so I certainly appreciate you being able to do that. I'm here for you, B.A. It's, uh, it's always great to be a dog, but same month, national championship, that's a good thing. Yeah, no doubt about that. And, you know, on the subject of it, you may bring up, you know, other names we heard for this job, the Heinz Wards, the the Terrence Edwards. I make no bones about this. You know, I love Terrence, and I'd love to see Terrence get a job like this sometime in the future. It sounds like that's something that he would, you know, like to do and hopefully get a chance to do that. I don't know Heinz Ward personally the way that I know Terrence, but I've got great respect for him there as well. And I know years ago I had a conversation with Heinz where he made it very clear that he did also want to be wide receivers coach at a place like Georgia. When Ward said that years ago, he had no experience. Now as a coach, he has some experience. But, John, I feel pretty comfortable saying that 
you know, given the need that Georgia has at the wide receiver coaching spot. This is the one position group that from a maybe a talent standpoint, but certainly from a performance standpoint, probably lags behind some of the other position groups a, a bit. A coach of the limited experience of Heinz Ward, that may be a level of experimentation that Georgia's just not, you know, it, it doesn't have the luxury of doing right now. That someone like McClendon, who is a bit more of a sure thing, has a history of being a good recruiter has a history of being an effective, valuable assistant at a number of spots previously UGA. That resume in my mind is just a lot more commensurate with what Georgia needs right now than what Heinz Ward would be. Honestly, McClendon's kind of an upwardly mobile dude. He could be looking for his you know, next job within a couple of years. And maybe at that point in time, someone like a Heinz Ward's more of a consideration or possibly a Terrence Edwards there as well. But it certainly seems like Georgia knowing it has a need at wide receiver seem to want to turn to someone who perhaps is a little bit more of a sure thing, which is what I think you can say that uh, Brian McClendon probably is. Yeah, and, and listen, the the ask of an assistant coach is so much broader than just know your position group well and be able to coach them to play that position at a high level. I, I, I think what fans need to understand is yeah, I, I could not agree more. Is there anyone better qualified in teaching a wide receiver the ins and outs of a position than Heinz Ward or Terrence Edwards? No, absolutely not. Both super highly successful on a personal level and have continued to share that knowledge of the position um, and, and what they do. I mean, Terrence is a guy who in the, in the local area has developed players not only who have gone to Georgia but to other schools, and, and you see the, the work – that he's done with them and they commend him on it. Um, That's a big piece of what the ask is, but it's not a complete picture. And when you're looking at uh, proven quantities and and proven commodities, uh, McClendon has been a guy who's been in the fold at a high level at uh, not only developing talent, but recruiting them. The the ask of, of formulating a game plan and being a part of those discussions on a weekend week out basis during the season. That's a big piece. It's not just, and hear me say, you know, as, as I've transitioned and as a number of other players have transitioned away from playing the game, uh, it's a draw to want to convey that knowledge of the yeah. position to the, to the next generation, if you will. Uh, but as, as an assistant coach at, at a collegiate level, especially at the level that Georgia is playing at, it's a nonstop 365 job. And it's not just developing your position group. So much more goes into it. Obviously recruiting is a big factor, but in, in game planning in uh, just the development of, of your entire offense and what that picture looks like McClendon's a guy who's been in those conversations for years. And I think that experience is, is why, He's more than qualified. I, I'm surprised that he's willing to step back into that position uh, position coach role and not continue to progress because he's been a guy that you think offensive coordinator, possibly in discussion for a head coach job, uh, would be more on the track that he was heading. It's a huge hire for Georgia because he's willing to, to step in the role that he's taking on in Athens. So uh, good to see Terrence Edwards, by the way, in the comment section, or at least I see people responding to him. So Terrence must be in there. And one of the things I thought was really cool on Thursday's show was we talked to Terrence and a lot of Georgia fans, including myself, kind of really touted him, you know, for a job like this. And Terrence certainly appreciates that and, you know, admitted his own personal ambitions there, but also said that he considers uh, Brian McClendon a good friend. He'd be very supportive of him. And he's obviously already been good to add his word on that. And that's been a really good thing to see. John, let me talk to you also for a moment about the specific challenge that awaits McClendon because, you know, Georgia recruits most position groups at such a high level that almost you know, it'd be very easy for something somewhere to, to pale in comparison. And at Georgia, the the level of success at the wide receiver spot in terms of the kinds of recruits that Georgia's brought in, the kind of maybe even on-field results when you look at some of the NFL draft stuff, you know, maybe that's an example of that, uh, of maybe leaving something to be desired. You know, Cortez Hankton had some recruiting wins, four top 10 receivers. I believe it's a total of five top 100 recruits. You know, you want to go back and look at Blaylock and Pickens from the 2019 class and then uh, Burton and Rosemary Jack Saint and Arian Smith from the 2020 class. But in other places, Georgia, in other position groups, Georgia stacking those five stars 
over and over again. Jeff Sintel had an interesting article at dognature.com yesterday where some five-star receivers that are not going to be at Georgia here for the 2022 class talked a little bit about why that not the case. They mentioned the usage rate and things like that, that for McClendon, who does have a history of recruiting elite talent, stepping into the wide receiver situation at Georgia, even though Georgia is the reigning national champion, and we don't gloss over that, but as reigning national champion, this is a wide receiver position at UGA that's probably dealing with a little bit of branding challenge, is it not? Well, possibly, but I think you just listed five names of some big-time recruits at that position that were willing to um, – go all in at Georgia and you, know, you lose Jermaine Burton. And obviously, you know, the, the spotlight goes back on this position group and Hankton moves on to LSU. Um, and you're looking at possibly being one recruiting cycle removed from some of these bigger names. With that said, uh, I, I remember the jubilation of getting George Pickens to flip right there at the, at the closing line when he was the, one of the top recruits and the big addition that he was to that recruiting class. So I don't think that every year you're going to hit on every five-star at a position group, um, but it, it's certainly been part of that conversation. I think one of the biggest reasons why this becomes the spotlight is because of Jermaine Burton switching, you know, switching from national championship teams from the victor to the, the, the loser in that scenario, and you look at it and you're going, why? Is it because of – uh, you know, Alabama throws the ball 10, 12 times on average more than Georgia does. Can he pad his stats and it look better at the end of the season on a personal level? Maybe. Maybe that is the reason. But I think another one of the factors in recruiting uh, some of the best receivers in the game is to make sure that you're, you're having the top quarterbacks across the nation come to your program and Georgia has that. I mean, Gunnar Stockton this year and years past, Carson Beck and Vandegrift, they've continued to be able to recruit quarterbacks that want to put up the gaudier numbers. Now, Stetson Bennett is the anomaly in that group, and he still, mm -hmm. still is the, the front runner and leader in this horse race uh, for this 2022 season just because he just won a national championship. And well, as well, he should be the front, the front runner and leader in the pack. But I, I think when you're talking about receivers, yes, they want to be drawn to uh, the possibility for big numbers and making big plays, but they want to be a part of a winner. Georgia offers that. They want to be a part of a program that's able to recruit quarterbacks that can get them the ball. Georgia has that. that that's two of the main factors for any wide receiver when they're looking at programs that they want to be a part of. A couple more issues I want to deal with uh, very quickly, by the way. This is kind of a makeshift version of our – Classic City Logger Insider Update with John Stinchcomb. For those of you who are just joining us in video, we were late getting started today. Had an issue with our audio board and studios, so we're just trying to make the best of it and at least get something here on the air for you. And uh, appreciate y'all being here with us and allowing us to at least present some sort of conversation for you, even if it's not the, the typical conversation we would do. But another story that pops up, and this had long been rumored to happen, and now it is official. Mike Bobo now on uh, Georgia staff once again, this time as an analyst. Uh, you know, Auburn offensive coordinator this past season, South Carolina offensive coordinator before that, Colorado State head coach before that, previously offensive coordinator at UGA final season 2014. So the resume there is fully established when it when it comes to all of that. John, this is one of those things where I think it, it's all good. There's there's nothing bad about it. I think one of the things that keeps the rich getting richer in college football, the strong being, being remaining strong is the presence of those off-field analysts. Everybody gets 10 assistant coaches. That's by rule. But outside the boundaries of that, you can kind of be whatever you want to be when it comes to your sports staff, your analysts, quality control types. And, you know, to have someone that's got the experience of Bobo now being able to pitch in in that role, a little bit like what a Jay Johnson would have been able to do before or, you know, what Will Muschamp was supposed to have been doing defensively before he was deputized back into duty – I think this is a pretty big ad for, for, for Georgia here and having someone of this level of experience, forget the fact that he's a favorite son, but having someone of this level of experience for UGA, I think is a really good thing. Well, the, you said it rich, get richer because coach Bobo has been successful yeah, at Georgia. I mean, you look back to, to when he was the offensive coordinator before he goes out to Colorado state and, and tries his hand at being a head coach 
the consistency that Georgia was having offensively to put up gaudy numbers uh, was pretty impressive. And even even the critics at the time were, were complaining about Bobo uh, not being able to put up numbers. And, and you look at the statistics when he was O.C., what a those were anomalies. Those were some of the best years Georgia's had offensively. So to have him back in the fold, I think it's huge. I think you look at uh, the ability for Georgia to, to add pieces, not only in the 10 uh, on-field coaches, but Muschamp is a great example of just having them in the building. You don't know where the opportunities are going to present themselves. You don't know when uh, s- some sort of change will occur where you need somebody to step in. And uh, I think when you saw Coach Muschamp willing to be a part of a winner, he wants to be a part of uh, this Georgia program. It's very similar to what we're seeing with Coach Bobo, who's saying this is a great opportunity. It, it may not be high in, in stature, uh, but just to be a part of this program and know that he has a voice, I think is huge. I think it speaks to the level that Georgia has ascended and you're able to draw some of these bigger names to take on these roles. Coach Bobo probably had other opportunities. Coach McClendon did have other opportunities, and they want to be a part of a winning program. Being a national championship does not just attract good players. It attracts good coaches, and and we're seeing that at the various opportunities that and roles that are being filled already. And, you know, I'm looking at these comments, and I'd love to see Terrence Edwards a part of the staff in some capacity as well. And, yeah. you know, maybe it's, it starts off as those quality control positions mm-hmm. and you never know where those go. So next year on the Georgia football facility, we're going to have about a hundred or so guys and about three different last names, right? There's multiple Bobos. There's going to be multiple McClendons. There's going to be multiple Muschamps. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see what a family affair Georgia football has become with, both Drew Bo, Mike Bobo being there, several must champs. You got uh, obviously Warren McClendon on the offensive line, Brian McClendon there, now back in the coaching staff. Nice to see so much Georgia legacy and and multiple generations of these Georgia tie-ins back in the Georgia staff. Uh, I think that's a, a, a pretty a pretty cool thing, especially for someone like you who also shares a last name with another guy that's kind of tied to Georgia history. We like keeping it in the family when we possibly can, John. Isn't it great? I mean, I, I love it. I, obviously, when I was coming in, it was Terrence, myself, and Boss Bailey, and we all right. had brothers on the team. So it was, yep. you know, Robert and Champ and Matt, and uh, McClendon's another one of those names that uh, it's been generational. And Tereshinsky's oh, yeah. and Frick's, and, you know, I, I think it speaks to the, the culture that's being created, that has been created in Athens, that you want to be a part of it. When you see Family, you know, it's not always the case. There are times where it's just there's a better opportunity and you don't want to force it on a kid or, or, or a sibling or a family member where it might be a better fit elsewhere. But I think it's really cool when you see multi-generations and, and multi-members of a family uh, that want to be a part of the same program because it, it means it was special and beneficial to, to other members and you see that opportunity uh, as being very similar for yourself. So I think it's really cool. Let me finish this one thing, John. I appreciate your time here today. Um, I know, and you and I have talked about this plenty before, that you really feel like one of the special things that you got a chance to do in your football career was win a, a Super Bowl. That's the kind of thing that just puts you on a stage that that nothing else in the sport really rivals. And yesterday we saw, you know, we, we knew one way or another is that some former dogs were going to be in the Super Bowl. Now we know who it is. Obviously, Trey Hill for the Cincinnati Bengals and, a very, if you talk about Southern accent, that uh, that LA Rams team, they definitely have some of that. Obviously, Matthew Stafford, I think, would probably be most prominent in this discussion. Um, you know, as someone who's traveled this past path yourself, what do you think about you know Stafford and others who get a chance now to go ahead and fulfill that dream for for themselves? How special do you think it is for them? Oh, I think it's huge, especially for Stafford and the and the path that he's been on. You know, he. Uh, having been in Detroit for as long as he was and the face of that organization. And, you know, I I think he took a a beating both in the media and physically um, that he just absorbed for the team for, for a number of years. And to see him have this opportunity, um, I think it's special. And I think it's uh, for all dog fans in the dog nation, 
we're proud of them, and we're proud for, of, of all of our guys when they get the opportunity to, to reach the pinnacle of their professional career, and he's on the doorstep, and, and, and a number of guys are. Leonard Floyd on the other side has been a, a, a key contributor uh, for this Rams team, and, and you're excited for uh, the dogs to be well represented again. I think the streak continues, not sure what, what the number is, uh, of, of years in a row where Georgia has been represented in the Super Bowl, but it's really cool. And, and we continue to put players in the NFL and that streak will continue. But uh, to see some of our own uh, continue to excel and have the opportunities to be a part of something that was really special. And, you know, I, I, having lifted the trophy on the field and seen the confetti fall on you, it's a great experience that you want for all your brothers. Do you know Matthew Stafford personally very well at all? Because I, I got to think it's got to be, you know, an interesting life for him in that, I mean, he was well famous before he ever signed at Georgia. You know, kind of the internet recruiting era was still fairly, I don't want to say it was new. It had been around for a while, but it's not, it wasn't then like it is now when he came to Georgia as part of the class of 2006 and has all these expectations. For the most part, he fulfills them in that he was the number one overall draft pick. Seems to be stuck in Detroit for a long time where you, I mean, it's just hard to win there. I mean, as, as a lot of folks have found out over the years, now finally gets a chance to be in a Sean McVay offense, get to the Super Bowl. I think he's been, you know, heavily embraced by the L.A. community. I don't want to make this whole story about Stafford because, I mean, Thomas Brown's the coaching staff, for goodness sakes. There's a lot of, you know, Georgia ties there. But, uh, you know, being the, the prince that was promised at quarterback the way that Stafford has for such a long time and finally getting a chance taste the Super Bowl that we expect big time quarterbacks like that to get to. I'm sure it's been an interesting life for Matthew. Oh, it's, it's, I don't know him. Well, have we met and talked a couple times? Yes. I wouldn't, you know, do we know each other? No, uh, not to a, to the level that I've known some other guys that have come, you know, through the Georgia ranks, but you know, he was one of the big recruits and he, you know, you talk about, that last year, and I think that was the, one of the last times pre-Kirby Smart era where Georgia comes into the season as the number one ranked team. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was Stafford and, and Moreno, and you think, man, this is a loaded roster. Um, and he's always had the talent. You, you, you've watched him play. You saw the highlights when he was coming out of high school in Texas, and you're going, this guy can sling the rock. And did the same thing in Athens, and, you know, at times – despite not having a great cast around him would carry that entire team in into some otherwise games that should not have been close. So I think just waiting for that opportunity and thinking that, you know, sometimes it just never happens for him to be uh, in a situation where you have a, a coach McVay that gets guys in the right spot and, and, and a supporting cast around him where, Cooper Cup had one of the best years for any receiver in the history of, of NFL football, and he was a relative unknown uh, in addition to OBJ and, you know, the, that entire roster of guys. Um, I think it's just it's, he, it was a matter of time whether or not if he'd had that opportunity to be surrounded by a supporting cast that he could really show his talents. And now you see when you, you put the pieces around him, what they're capable of, and he's on the verge of a, a, a Super Bowl championship. So it's huge. John, I really appreciate your time, and I know it's a little bit different than what we normally do here, but uh, your flexibility, certainly appreciate that. Always a fun conversation on a number of fronts. So I hope you have a great week, and we'll look forward to uh, getting a chance to chat with you again very soon. Always, B.A. It's good times. Go dogs. Yes, sir, John. Thanks so much for your time. And this is Dog Nation Daily presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. For those of you just joining us, so – Something happened in the studio today. Still don't quite know what. Audio board wasn't really working. We don't have audio. We really can't do the show. So we scrambled a couple different ways. And, you know, finally you're able to at least put something out here on the screen for you. So we're pretty casual, pretty laid back. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's obviously not what you want. But uh, obviously you just kind of make the best of it. By the way, appreciate Pella Window and Door of George for making it all possible, as they all always do. You know, energy-efficient windows and doors important when the – I mean, it's cold this weekend. It was really crazy Friday night. So I'm uh, sitting at home and you look out the window late, you know, 11 p.m., something like that. You start seeing snow coming. up. It's really snowing pretty good. And obviously, you know, you got the heat cranked up, you get the fire in the fireplace, you get all that kind of stuff to be going on. Um, and obviously, you want to keep that on the inside. You don't want that stuff because it's expensive. It's expensive to 
you know, gas fireplace or a heating system, things like that. It's expensive right now. You want to do everything you can to keep that energy on the inside of your house where it's supposed to go. And that's what Pella Window and Door of George can do for you. They also can give you a free, no pressure consultation, expert advice from one of the folks that, that knows about the product and why Pella Window is so beloved. Atlanta homeowners uh, have, have really, you know, kind of named this as the most preferred window brand uh, for the entire year. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, surveys, things like that, that continue to repeatedly demonstrate just how beloved the Pella product is, Pella windows and doors. So great savings too. Between now, April 21st, you're going to get 50% off qualifying installations. You love that. Uh, so make sure you check them out. Pella of GA.com slash dog nation. That's the website. Pella of GA.com slash uh, dog nation, or you can give them a call 678-638-1496. That's 678-638-1496. So let me do this. Let me just do a few thoughts on the McClendon thing of my own here. And then I want to just take some of your comments and we'll just be generally pretty casual all the way around here. We'll just kind of combine RS Andrews cool down and regular show and just try to put a bow on this and come back and do it again tomorrow. Maybe. So, I, I do feel like that Brian McClendon, the new wide receivers coach of Georgia, faces a pretty significant challenge. Now, let me say this in full context. Obviously, Georgia's the reigning national champion. That whatever, for the good or the bad, that may be going on with the Georgia wide receiver situation, it did not prevent Georgia from winning the national championship. That's got to be reminded in discussions like this, especially when it seems like there's a little bit of a fixation with pretty wide receiver play, uh, you know, that kind of flashy Instagram highlight type brand of football. People seem to have a fixation with that sometimes. So it's important to remind folks that whatever Georgia isn't at wide receiver, it did not stop it from being national champions. However, even when I say that, that doesn't mean, though, that Georgia doesn't want to be as good at every position group as it possibly can be, wide receiver included. And if you look at the overall level of draft success or on-field production or whatever else, it is just a fact that Georgia probably lags at wide receiver in comparison to the other position groups. And in some respects, Cortez Hankton's tenure at Georgia actually raised the level of UGA wide receiver recruiting. We've given him credit for that a, a number of times. But a little bit more consistent version of recruiting at the wide receiver position to match what's going on other places, I, I do think that's going to be really important. And that may be one of the reasons why Georgia has turned to an experienced name like McClendon in order to be able to get that done. But as I mentioned to John, and John seemed to, to, to not fully buy into this as much as I do, but, but nonetheless, I think that Georgia faces a little bit of a branding issue on this. I saw Jeff Sintel's story, dognation.com, uh, yesterday, where he talked to, going back to the All-Star season, guys like Evan McPherson, uh, Evan McPherson, excuse me, Guys like Evan Stewart, guys like Luther Burden, Andre Green Jr., about, you know, what they felt about Georgia. They clearly were considering Georgia at one point, but ultimately Georgia finished either second or third in their recruitment. They were comfortable going somewhere else. And I think when you listen to a lot of what's said there, I don't find it to be alarming. You know, I don't probably read as much into it as some people maybe do, but it does kind of speak to the – the, the way in which the Georgia receiver spot might be perceived by the kinds of recruits you want to win with. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. I'm going to show you a quote here. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to read it to you from uh, uh, Evan Stewart. Yeah, this is a uh, five-star wide receiver, Evan Stewart. Let me just read this to you. This is from the story at Jeff Sintel. Okay, we do have this on screen. So he says, uh, wide receivers want to see production. You're not going to go uh, nowhere if they don't produce. It's really not even a must production-wise. And he says it. I think he means it is a must. If you can just see what you can do in the offense, then it helps. But when you watch the offense and you know that you're not going to fit in it, you just don't get excited and you look elsewhere. That's Evan Stewart talking about some of the, the reasons why he did not choose Georgia. Now, here's one of the reasons why I don't get overly fixated on what Evan Stewart says there. He's going to Texas a and <laughs> And whatever issues Georgia – has had at the wide receiver spot. Texas A&M has had the same kind of issues. In fact, I would say that Georgia is probably a little bit more prolific in the passing game than what Texas A&M has been. And I say that as somebody who thinks of Jimbo Fisher as a pretty good, uh, pretty good, you know, coach. Certainly, a history of tutoring quarterbacks and and you know, track record speaks for itself. But when it comes to producing offensive football at A&M, that really hasn't happened yet. The success that he's enjoyed on the field, to the extent any of it's occurred 
has been mostly because of the Mike El- Oko defense and mostly because of what's happened on both lines of scrimmage. A&M's run the ball pretty well. They have a lot of two-back sets, things like that, but they haven't thrown the ball very well at all. So when someone like Evan Stewart, even though this is you know an accurate quote of him, when someone like Stewart says this, frankly, I'm not going to freak out about that too much because – there's just an illogical nature to his decision-making. Well, all this stuff is true of Georgia. That's why I didn't go there. And yet I'm going to go to a place like Texas A&M where the challenges related to throwing the football are at least as present, if not more so. Uh, That just doesn't seem to to make very much sense to me. I'm just not going to worry about that too much. Same thing for a guy like Luther Burden and that same story with Jeff Centel, who seemed to take issue with the fact that Brock Bowers got so many touches and had so much success at UGA. But as we said before, the reason why Brock Bowers got so many touches, the reason why Brock Bowers put up so many numbers is because that's how good he is. Uh, Todd Munkin realized before the season even began that they had something special in Bowers. That's why he was mentioning Bowers unprompted during his preseason press conference that took place right there, kind of the start of the summer practices, you know, way back there in what, July, August, whenever it was that the uh, conversation took place, I guess it would have been early August. Way back when that took place, he was bringing up Bowers unprompted because he knew he had something special. So why do they keep feeding Bowers over and over again? Because Bowers was that good. So if Luther Burden says, I can't go to a place that features the tight end this much, trust me when I tell you, if Luther Burden was as good as Brock Bowers, he'll get every bit those same level of touches. And if it comes down to a choice of who do I want in my program, the promise of what Luther Burden might be or the the actual tangible proof of what Brock Bowers is, that's not a difficult choice for me. Bowers, I believe, is clearly a better player because most people are simply not going to be able to match what he did statistically. So I don't even really freak out about what uh, Luther Burton said in the Dog Nation story. As interesting the story was, I take some of the quotes from those receivers with a bit of a grain of salt. However, the overall track record does kind of speak for itself. I see uh, Kamel mentioned this in the comment section. He says, we need to create a thousand yard wide receiver. So elite receivers want to come here. That's the part I do kind of agree with that. Even if you can kind of squabble a bit with what burden or Stewart says about why they didn't come to Georgia. The fact that guys like this have continuously not come to Georgia does speak volumes. It is a lack of statistical success. Terrence Edwards was in our comment section a little earlier. The only thousand yard wide receiver in the history of the program. Uh, you know, long drought of first-round wide receivers. I don't think George's had a first-round wide receiver since A.J. Green. And what's horrifying is I think the wide receiver draft in the first round prior to that may have been Lindsey Scott. Is that true? Am I, am I missing something here? Um, that, that when you talk about first-round receivers, just in the last 40, 50 years of Georgia football, there just haven't been a, a ton of them. And over the course of time, that just becomes the way the program gets branded in the eyes of, of, of future recruits. Georgia is kind of known as RRBU. Brian McClendon's time working here in the past is one of the things that helps cement that status. Bringing it into the, the current contemporary age, McClendon, I think, takes a lot of credit for that, for the work that he did as a recruiter. But the way in which Georgia is kind of thought of as a sexy brand for running backs and obviously great defensive players in the Kirby Smart era, that's not quite what the wide receiver position has going for it right now which speaks to the challenge awaiting McClendon. Now, there's also some evidence to suggest that this is going to really pay off here. I saw where Brandon Ennis, a lot of you know Ennis as a top receiver of the class of 2023. He went on Twitter yesterday right after the McClendon hire to sh- express some surprise saying, wait, what? Uh, yeah, there you go. Wait, what? Coach Mac just went to UGA and kind of gives you the emoji that suggests the mind's blown or something like that. And so that does speak to the fact that McClendon does have cachet with elite receivers. He does have cachet with these kinds of players, but he steps into a position group where the brand is just not as fully filled out, where you do have to explain to folks how you're going to be used. Now, there's another thing where you kind of go back to tight end position here for a moment, because at one point in time, Let's talk about recruiting Ari Gilbert for the class. Uh, was it 2020? Is that the class he was in? Class of 2020. Let's talk about recruiting Ari Gilbert, where you know, you're know you going to him and you're saying, hey, we haven't used tight ends like you before, but when you come to a place like this, we're going to start using you. It's one of those things of don't look at what we've done, listen to what I'm saying, and ultimately it, it's actually the, the picture you see in your mind that's worth more than any kind of words were. So a guy like Todd Hartley is a good a recruiter as he's in, Uh, as he is, was in a pretty difficult position trying to recruit a guy like Gilbert back then because you had to say, I realize we haven't done this kind of thing in the past, but we haven't had a player as good as you. So if you come here, we'll use you. 
for someone like Gilbert, he just wasn't buying that. Jaden Hazel just kind of wasn't buying that around that same time. They just weren't they just weren't buying the idea that that Georgia wasn't doing the kinds of things that those players wanted it to because it had hadn't had those kinds of players. But then lo and behold, a guy like Brock Bowers comes along, and Bowers all of a sudden now he does become proof of concept. He does become a spec that you can show to. And I've talked to Oscar Delp about this. Uh, you know, Delp openly admits that the thing that ultimately swayed him towards George, even though George was always a strong consideration for him, uh, the thing that ultimately swayed Delp towards Georgia was is that all of a sudden he didn't have to use his imagination anymore. You got to watch those HGTV shows, things like that, where they're going to do big home remodel. And, you know, they're always asking that homeowner before the, the work takes place to picture in your mind what this might look like. And it's just very hard for people to do that. And maybe it's hard for recruits to do that too. And so, you know, for the previous generation of great tight ends, they just could not get an accurate picture in their mind of what the Georgia offense could look like with them at the center of it. For, for a guy like Delp, he says, I didn't have to use my imagination. I simply looked at a guy who physically somewhat looks a little bit like me and saw the level of produ production that he was you know, putting forth. And all of a sudden now I can comfortably say, if I go to Georgia, I will be used that way. The recruiting work became very much easier. And the wide receiver track record can eventually play out the same way. But you got to find a couple of guys who want to be first through the door. you got to find a couple of guys who want to – become that proof of concept for the next generation the way that Brock Bowers did. And that means that you can recruit some guys to do that, or you can take some guys who are already here because that's a part of the equation as well. Once again, something you have to give Cortez Hankton a, a little bit of credit for was the way in which he got a lot out of someone like Lad McConkey. That's the kind of person that maybe as a recruit, I don't want to lie here. I, maybe I probably just disregarded a bit. Oh, too small, too whatever. You know, not 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 much to consider. Cortez Hankton got something out of him. A.D. Mitchell, a little bit of an unusual background story. Didn't, you know, play prior to coming to UJ the previous year. And you're really not quite sure what you had in A.D. Mitchell. And yet, look what his freshman season became. Credit to Cortez Hankton for doing that. And now Brian McClendon in this role is going to have his chance to develop much the same way. You can bring new guys into the program, but you can also get more out of the guys you've had in the program. Whether that be the the unheralded guys who've proven to be better than we would have ever expected, or those former four stars still lingering who are ready for the possibility of a breakout season, a healthier Dominic Blaylock, a one final year of Kyrus Jackson, uh, Marcus Roseme Jackson, healthier now than maybe he has been. Obviously plenty of accolades in his past. Arian Smith, healthier now than he has been. Clearly bringing the element of speed that, that other Georgia receivers don't, necessarily have uh, all of that at the disposal for Brian McClendon. So all of a sudden McClendon now gets to do that work of rebranding the wide receiver position at UGA the same way that defensive back and linebacker and offensive line, running back, tight ends, these position groups have all become the kind of spots where Georgia looks like the place to be, the kind of place where you can come in and, and, and surround yourself with other great talent and emulate previous great talent at that position Maybe soon wide receiver will, will kind of be the same thing. Obviously, McClendon hired with all of that in mind and can't wait to see the work that he does to, to bring all that together. So if you're just joining us you know, on video here, a little bit different kind of version of our show with uh, technical difficulties, whatever else. So we're just kind of rolling through, making the best of it. Let me just do kind of a quick, I, I guess I'll do an SEC through here. Obviously, Royal Caribbean, uh, great to uh, have them with us as always. Looking forward to being on a Royal Caribbean ship myself here coming up. Very soon, excited about that. Cruise and Vacation Authority, who we want you encouraged to book with. Uh, you can check them out online, tcava.com. That's tcava.com. Or you can call them 770-952-8300, 770-952-8300, Royal Caribbean. Uh, the place to go on all of that. Onboard excitement. Uh, the show's unbelievable. Broadway-style productions, the Aqua Theater uh, on some of the ships that has the high dive shows, the ice skating shows, uh, it's just all uh, really incredible. You can see uh, Greece. You can see all kinds of Broadway productions. Just a really, really fun thing to be a part of. So Royal Caribbean, uh, just a, a really, really fun experience. I can't wait to be on ships. Can't wait to to hopefully be with some view on some ships here coming up. It's just going to be a, a great time. So check them out, tcava.com. That's the website for the Cruise and Vacation Authority. That's who we encourage you to uh, to reach out to, to help book your Royal Caribbean cruise. You can also give them a call, 770-952-8300. I'll tell you this, I was on the phone with uh, David from uh, Cruise and Vacation Authority the other day. I had a couple of questions about 
a Royal Caribbean cruise. He had great information for me, easy answers, uh, just really a lot of uh, in-depth knowledge there that I found to be very, very enjoyable. So please make sure you check out all of that. Uh, so let's do a couple of things here. Uh, the Brian Kelly thing was out there. I don't think we have this video for you, but we will show you that maybe tomorrow on the Kelly thing. Uh, really just pretty funny. I have some thoughts on that. I'll wait and show that to you tomorrow. We're going to do that today. Let me instead talk more about this. And uh, Raphael Wright brought this up in the comment section. There is something really weird going on at Auburn. And we've talked to you about this now for a while. And I think the point that we keep bringing up is it's amazing how little attention this seems to be getting. That Auburn as a program, we're only five years removed from Auburn winning the SEC West. They were very much a contender for the college ball playoff back in 2017. Played for a national title as recently as 2013. That's less than 10 years ago. Won a national championship less than 15 years ago. That this is a uh, – wait, that's not right. Yeah, no, if you have 15 years ago, less than 15 years ago. This is a program that at one point in time was very much in the upper crust of the SEC, very much in the upper crust of college football. But my gosh, in the aftermath of Gus Malzahn being ousted, and he's now at UCF, it just seems like there's a failure to launch with the Brian Harson administration. And I don't think you look any further than the issue with coordinators. Obviously, the Mike Bobo thing didn't last very long. But then the Derek Mason departure, that that the coordinators that you brought in, because remember, Malzahn is a, uh, should say, Harson is a very tough sell to SEC fans because he's such an SEC outsider. And so part of the way you make that a little bit more palatable to the Auburn audience is you say, well, he's an outsider, but he's got Mike Bobo's offensive coordinator track record of success. Derek Mason is defensive coordinator, track record in the SEC, and also a successful coordinator prior to that at Stanford before becoming Vanderbilt head coach. The presence of Mason and Bobo allowed the sell of Harson to be a little easier for the Auburn administration. But then a year later, Bobo's out. The coordinator coming in is Austin Davis. That's a guy that nobody knows. Uh, Mason is out. The coordinator that's taking his place is it. Not Schmeling. What's the guy's name? Or whatever it is. Nobody really knows who he is either. And suddenly it feels like for a lot of Auburn fans, we've been sold a bill of goods. That's what Auburn fans, you know, might be saying there. Then lo and behold, it looks like Austin Davis is potentially now out as well. And it's amazing, at least as of this morning, when I was reading about this, uh, you know, for the last time before coming on and, you know, getting ready to do the show. It's amazing how little actual information there is about this. There's certainly strong speculation that no one's denying that Davis is gone, but at least of this morning before the show began, I haven't seen anything since then. I don't believe anyone's outright confirmed that Davis is definitely not coming back, although that's the expectation here. And no one seems to know why that is. There are a number of rumors that no one seems to want to confirm, but but certainly on the record, no one seems to want to talk about why it is that Davis, after a few weeks in the job, is now apparently stepping away from the job. But when you couple this with Derek Mason, who also left for the Oklahoma State job, we told you the time, under normal circumstances, not, that's not the kind of thing that typically happens in the SEC, nor should it happen in the SEC. Uh, you know, Oklahoma State is not really a lateral move from Auburn. It's a step down there. And so for someone like Mason, former head coach, to take something south of a lateral move makes it seem like maybe he wanted to get away from Auburn for some reason because no one has come out to say that that Harson wanted to move off from Derrick Mason. You better believe that if there was any attempt to spin this in favor of Auburn, that's what somebody would want to do, and yet the fact that didn't happen in the Mason situation speaks to a couple of things. The, the inability to spin that positively and the unwillingness of anybody around the Auburn program to, to want to do just that. Now here's the Austin Davis thing as well guy who would come to the NFL and come from the NFL, come down to Auburn, now stepping away. This is really weird. This is very, very weird at Auburn right now and probably worth following a little more closely. I would certainly expect Brian Harson to still coach this season, meaning this upcoming fall. But you got to wonder beyond that how a guy like this sticks around there if he can't even convince coaches to stick around. He's lost tons of coaches, tons of players to transfer portal, Discount that if you want, because everybody kind of has. But boy, there is not a lot of stability at Auburn right now. It just seems like the whole thing is is just not really being discussed very much. Jackson Dart, former USC quarterback, has landed officially at Ole Miss. That's one of the dominoes to fall for the quarterback thing. We're still waiting for Caleb Williams to announce his intentions. Is the Wisconsin thing with Williams real? We don't really know. 
Is the USC thing still a foregone conclusion? Don't really know. But Dart is now at Ole Miss. And so it's a pretty big get, I would say, for the Rebels. And an example of, obviously, Lane Kiffin trying to pick up where he left off with the success that he had with with, uh, Matt Corral, now trying to do the same thing with Jackson Dart. So Dart in the fold there for the Ole Miss Rebels, and this will be one to watch to see you know how it fits in with the with the rest of the transfer story and uh you know a little bit of a changeover there for Ole Miss changeover in coordinators you know a little bit of that kind of thing going on but but obviously for a team on the field under Lane Kiffin that was pretty successful that is probably worth uh paying attention to we'll make that cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean today I'll also mention as we head towards Wednesday National Signing Day Seems like Georgia, and there's a lot of really cool stuff on social media about this over the weekend. Seems like Georgia made a pretty good impression on Andrew Paul, the running back out of Texas. I don't know how I tell you. I didn't even know who Paul was five days ago. I mean, I just, I'm not going to pretend to be anything other than I am. Uh, but, you know, seems like he had a very good senior season. His stats are eye popping. I mean, eye popping stats. I guess level of play becomes a little bit of a question there, but the stats themselves certainly speak highly. Um, he puts himself on Instagram of himself, you know, at the hotel. And then he had a lot of pictures of him you know, posing the national championship trophy. Uh, it seems like Georgia did a pretty good job. And if you want to establish credentials here for the kind of back that he is, it sounds like Georgia battled Clemson down to the wire for him as, or it, I should not, let me not say this in the past tense, because I guess it's still going on. Georgia is battling Clemson down to the wire for him. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing there on that, that if you're beating out Clemson, who, as Jeff Sintel reminded us on Friday, does not currently have a receiver running back, does not currently have a running back in its 2022 class, um, you know, that gives you an idea of, of, the, of the level of recruiting win this might be. Georgia wants that second back. Apparently Jordan James uh, wants to go elsewhere. Maybe he didn't feel the love after not really being able to sign with the dogs in December and who knows what's happened since then. Maybe a lack of communication between those two parties, Georgia still wants that second running back. And Paul, we're getting acquainted with, at least some of us are. And you find out, well, you know, maybe Georgia beating out Clemson here for services, that maybe that's an example of that. But one way or another, it seems like Georgia did make an impression and a positive one on him there, there uh, this week. So uh, really good stuff. We'll get back to Golden Shoe tomorrow. Also tell you Gatorade or Updater, lousy stinking Gators, 4,771 days since they have won a national championship. Always like to remind them of that. Also, Gator Hater Countdown, 271 days from now, Georgia gives Florida another loss. Love doing that there as well. National champions stepping into Jacksonville, strutting their way in, putting a beat down on the Gators after that. So uh, good stuff, and we'll make that today's edition of Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We'll also roll in here to a little bit of a quick cool down and uh, fun to be able to do that with you. Take a few of your comments and. Obviously, we just try to make the best situation. I certainly appreciate you uh, being flexible with us and allowing us to do all of that. And let's see how it's going. Uh, Jordan Bowman, our resident Clemson, Clemson fan, says Georgia needs a running back more than Clemson does. So maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case. Uh, I don't really know Clemson's running back depth. I mean, I actually feel pretty good about Georgia's running back depth right now, but maybe that's the case. Keith Fold says Vince Dooley said the Georgia G was forward looking. Let's do the same. Um, BA's Natty Scarf says, Who do you have winning the Super Bowl? I guess the Rams would be my early pick. I, I, I will say this, though. I thought Sean McVay had a weird day yesterday. Um, I thought some of the challenges were a little weird. You know, McVay's one of those guys. There's this category of coach in the NFL now, it's sort of the stubble beard crowd, you know. And they all kind of come across these cool customers, relaxed. McVay didn't seem super relaxed to me yesterday. And ultimately, he wins the game. But but I don't know, man. Um, you know, I, two coaches that I think of as pretty sharp, Shanahan and McVay, I thought they both had some real tense moments in this postseason. McVay more yesterday. Shanahan really a, over the course of the last couple of weeks. It just kind of goes to show you, even smart coaches can have weird moments. So, so my whole impression of McVeigh was just kind of weird yesterday, just a little bit strange all the way around. Um, but early, Steve Allen says he thinks he's wound tight. It certainly seemed like he was yesterday, wound a little tighter than I sometimes want to give him credit for. So, uh, so you know, you know, listen, sometimes when you're we, – we've seen this happen before. 
you know, we saw what the giant, like I'm going back to Eli Manning days, you know, sometimes when you're in, in the kind of the nobody believes in this camp, when you're on the road in the playoffs, it just allows you to be a little bit more relaxed. You know, we saw Cincinnati win on the road twice. You know, they win uh, at, at uh, Tennessee, win at, uh, uh, you know, Kansas City yesterday. Sometimes that leads to a situation where you're just a little bit relaxed. And maybe they kind of have that going for them right now. I, I don't know. The point is, I don't quite have a Super Bowl pick as of yet. But my temptation just to rubber stamp L.A., some of the ways in which I saw these two title games playing out yesterday kind of tempt me not to do that. Wally Smith on the subject of the Stetson Bennett Celebration Day in Blackshear, Georgia, says he wasn't able to attend. But I do like it when you see these Georgia guys get their moment. That's kind of cool. I, I, think, I think it's really fun. I mean, you know, there is just no discounting what it means to be kind of a favored son. I'm from Hall County originally. And, you know, we had a couple of guys, right? Uh, Jody Davis, when I was a kid, played Major League Baseball was an all-star for the Chicago Cubs, eventually came to Atlanta. But that's a guy that had amazing cachet in the town because, you know, he's a local guy that made good. Chris Carpenter after that was a punter at Georgia, also ended up being a pitcher in the major leagues, I guess most prominently the St. Louis Cardinals. He was a pretty big pitching prospect at one point in time. But it's another local guy that folks love to this day. You know, Sean Watson, still a beloved figure in Gainesville, my hometown. And even a guy like Dan Jackson from North Hall. I, I can tell you there's been a lot of local media coverage about Jackson, a lot of love for him because it's just cool to see one of your hometown guys do well. And I don't live in Hall County anymore, but I'll always think about that as, as, as my hometown. It's also one of those things where Hall County's always been far enough removed from Atlanta, even though now if you drive around, it sort of feels like an Atlanta suburb, but, but, it's still far enough outside where it feels like you can be from Gainesville without thinking you're from Atlanta. Like where I've lived, you know, and since then more in suburban Atlanta, people don't really think of themselves as, Hey, I'm from, you know, even a place like Swanee necessarily, you know, it's, I, I lived in Swanee for a long time. You know, I think a lot, most people kind of thought of Swanee as sort of the Atlanta area. I don't think they kind of felt like it had its own a little bit of a bedroom community didn't really quite have its own, distinctive characteristics whereas you get a few more minutes outside of that Atlanta circle and that Atlanta bubble and it just feels a lot more like a true hometown and so get seeing guys get their celebration like Stetson and Blackshear others it's great to be able to see CB says Aaron Donald and Von Miller are going to be uh, eating all day against that Bengals trash offensive line that's certainly an issue and our buddy Chuck Smith you talk about personal coaches we love the work that Terrence Edwards does for you know, those pass catchers, uh, Chuck Smith in the Atlanta area does a great thing for pass rushers. He and Aaron Donald very close. He's worked with Donald in the past. I know this is a big day for uh, Chuck Smith to see Donald having the success he's having on that national stage because uh, Chuck worked with Aaron and touted him as a big time player at the NFL level. And a lot of you uh, know Chuck and know the work you know Chuck and I have done together over the years. And so I'm very happy for Chuck Smith today for the work that he's done with guys like Aaron Donald. By the way, Chuck also doing great work with Christian Miller and and Mikhail Williams, you know, he's a big influence in a lot of these defensive line, front seven, pass rusher type guys. So uh, happy to have that. By the way, Frank Patterson also steps up to say, hey, when you talk about that Bengals offensive line, don't forget about Trey Hill there at the center spot, which is very true. Uh, that as a unit it has had its struggles, gave up nine sacks to the, the Titans the other day. But obviously uh, a lot of Georgia fans also rooting for Trey Hill there as well. The Jordan, Jordan Harris says the Davis news is now official. He is out. At Auburn, I, I'm I'm curious to see if uh, uh, anyone goes on the record. He says the news dropped about 20 minutes ago. Jordan, thank you very much. Uh, that is now official, so it is indeed true and final. Davis is done, and now let's find out now that he is gone what people say about his departure. I'm very curious about that because a lot of the so-called insiders are pretty tight-lipped about this prior to this, which. You know, if it ends up being some sort of personal issue for Davis, then, uh, you know, obviously that's one thing. But if it becomes some of the other stuff that's been suggested that maybe he didn't quite know what he was getting into or something like that, boy, that, that's not a good look at all. Bob Garrison says, UGA is like Roman Reigns and Bama's like Brock Lesnar. We are the ones. Uh, pretty interesting comparison by Bob Garrison. I watched some of the Royal Rumble on uh, Saturday night. That was pretty good. Uh 
Avery Swan says you can stop wearing the scarf now. Scar- Scarf's going to stay on until about the start of spring practice. Uh, that's when the scarf is. Uh, that, that's when the scarf's coming off, probably. Um, uh, let's see what else. Uh, Steve Highland says that dog destruction lingers. Yeah, Georgia fans feeling pretty good about that. Um, Thomas Van Sena says that U- UGA is Real Madrid. So I don't know enough about international soccer to know if that's a compliment. I'm assuming it probably is because uh, I figure if Real Madrid is one of the handful of, uh, you know, international club teams that I have heard of, they must be pretty good. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have heard of them. I have uh, been playing that FIFA game with my son a little bit. Let me tell you something, that's really fun. I think that soccer is a sport that I probably would have liked a lot more um, had I grown up with it. Because you play FIFA, something like that, really pretty fun. Uh, but I don't know a ton about Real. Uh, Jonathan Aaron says, do you think they'll move Gilbert to wide receiver? I think that Gilbert will be, assuming that, you know, uh, obviously continues to do the work that's needed to be back in a position so, so that he can play next season. I think that he may kind of follow one of those kind of positionless tracks. You know, it's like you see the way in which they've used Darnell Washington at times. Sometimes he's a traditional tight end. He's much bigger than Reed Gilbert is, but sometimes he's lined up in a way that's not really like that at all. I'd say the same thing about Brock Bowers there too. I know Gilbert has wanted to be thought of as a wide receiver, and so maybe that makes them more likely to even use him that way. But ultimately, I'm just, you know, I'm going to sound like a hippie for a second. I'm I'm just not that into labels anymore. I'm just not that much into labels when it comes to these pass-catching guys. So do I think that Gilbert will, will be used a lot in a way that's detached from the offensive line? Probably so. Do I think there's a wild degree of difference between what Brock Bowers does for the Georgia offense and what a traditional wide receiver does? I honestly don't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if he does the work to be on the football field and continues to be on that path, then being a little bit more of a true wide receiver, that may make some sense for him. Um, I also know that on the software we're using right now, we don't get dognation.com comments in here. So let me pull those up myself. And we'll do a few dognation.com comments as well. And hopefully we'll be back to normal and all this tomorrow. Uh, Steve Island says, Arik has Pickens measurables. I've always felt that way. That the guy that when you first started talking about, you know, uh, Gilbert coming to Georgia, the guy on the roster that probably you would probably compare the most to him would have. I don't know if this is just my device or something else, but we seem to have some issues there with Nation dug out. But um, the guy I would have always compared him to the most would have been George Pickens. That Pickens and Gilbert are actually fairly similar, I've always felt like. Uh, more similar than, than, say, Gilbert and Washington would have been for sure. Um, let's see what else. Texas Dog says the Georgia offense needs to take advantage of the height and jumping skills of Darnell Washington. Um, all right, so here's a different call. Maybe it's just my phone that's messing up. Let me do a couple of uh, dognation.com uh, comments. Randy Hall says, what a look in the future. Maybe the beard, the scar for the fireside stories. I know you kind of you know, you kind of go old school like that. Uh, Hassan says, didn't realize DeAndre Baker was with the Chiefs. Yeah, he was there. You had Baker and McColl with the Chiefs, Trey Hill with the, with the Bengals. Charlie Warner was on the 49ers and then 8,000 former dogs in the Rams. Steve Island says the show's a little disjointed. Yeah, I told you, I'm not in a very good mood today. It's just, we're just going to do the best we can. I apologize. I apologize. Randy Glass also pointing out that Mike Moonpie Wilson was from Gainesville as well. And that's true. We're talking about hometown guys a little earlier. So he's a little older than I am, actually a good bit older than I am, but his NFL career, he was with what the Bengals and the Seahawks, right? He played in the Super Bowl the first time the Bengals made that because Bengals been, this is the third time since I've been the Super Bowl. The first time I believe he played in that game. And I'm not really old enough to remember that first when it was Ken Anderson for the Bengals against, against Joe Montana. I'm not really old enough to remember that. And I believe that's the one that Moon Pie played in for Cincinnati. Of course, he's a former dog himself. I mostly remember him when he was at Seattle. This is towards the end of his career. But I went to Johnson High School. Moon Pie also went to Johnson there as well. So 
um, uh, for sure. Frank Patterson says the technical difficulty shows are actually some of the best. I do think about this sometimes just to be, I'll be totally candid for a moment. Like, do you know, it's like you ever notice like some of the barstool shows and things like that. Like think about Portnoy for a second. I never, some of you like Portnoy, some of you don't. I, I, this is not the point. What I do notice about some of the stuff that he does is that, and barstool has got all the money in the world. I mean, they got just gazillions of dollars, but Portnoy doesn't even try to be a uh, professional you know, like he'll do one of those like impromptu press conferences. I don't watch everything Barstool does, but I, if you're going to be on the internet, it's going to be hard to miss some of the stuff they do. So like Portnoy's got like a microphone sitting on top of a water cooler or something like that. It's like, you know, they're streaming on a phone. Like they don't even try to be uh, technically uh, savvy. So, I mean, sometimes there is something to say for, you know, still being a little low tech every now and then just kind of doing it that way. And I'll be honest with you. I think it works pretty well for video. The place the, the the place the low tech thing doesn't work as well for is for our podcast audience, and you know, the podcast. No disrespect to the platform is probably still the single largest daily platform that we have, and so I, I feel like when we're low tech, we don't have good microphones and good things like that. I feel like their product probably suffers more than anything else. So on video, it's just easier to convey the low tech thing because you can at least see my face and you can kind of see what we're doing, but the, uh, but the low tech thing just doesn't work as well for podcast. Brian Whitehead said things could have been worse. We could have had music blasting in uh, the background the entire time. I referenced on Twitter yesterday with uh, what's the guy's name is it Walker Hayes that does the Applebee song and he's got the speakers just blare. First of all, Walker Hayes actually did halftime at the orange bowl too, but just blasting and blaring that music. And what's funny is those microphones are actually fairly well designed. They're not really supposed to pick up a lot of ambient noise like that, but that's how loud it was yesterday that even those, you know, stick mics are still picking up that, that noise. And that's, I mean, I, I said this on CB uh, on, on Twitter yesterday that when CBS has those kind of issues for the AFC championship game, it's kind of a important, important reminder to me not to take myself quite so seriously. Um, so, so yeah, that's true. Hassan says it's 12 and 0 a given. It's pretty interesting. Remember, over under bets are are based on uh are based on regular season games. So if you're betting Georgia over for the upcoming season, it's based on regular season. So does Georgia's over under total, will it be 11 and a half? That's that's basically what Hassan is getting to here. Will the will the over under for Georgia this upcoming season be 11 and a half? We've seen 11 and a half before. It'll be very, it'll be very, very, uh, uh, very, very curious to see. Frank Patterson says the show does look like the interview in the locker room after an intercontinental title match. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just kind of swung things around just because I wanted to put Pell on the screen, but yeah, you can see it's actually not, not Connor that's back today. It's Michael Carvel. But so this is what, so this is what I see when I do the show every day. Um, that's you see one of the cameras, right? Let me see if I can do this. There you go. That's one of our cameras. So I'll show you some of this. So I, I got one camera here. That's the control room. The, the Pella thing right here, that's a monitor that I usually use. I also have a second monitor over here. If I'm looking to the side, I can see right there. We have a total of three cameras. You can see two. Let's see if I can find the third. But yeah, so when I'm doing the show every day, this is what it looks like for me. This is what I see. G. Grace Bama Boy says, show is great today. No clowns, just good football talk. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Johnny Dog says, it looks like a bathroom. Where are you getting a bathroom from? Um, uh, th th this, this, sh this studio is actually a good bit smaller than the one we used to be in, but it works very well. Uh, Lucy Bowers Boykin going to the grocery store. Thanks for uh, being here. Appreciate that. Uh, Dave Chancey says, active duty Air Force, 2004 UGA grad, currently stationed in South Korea for a year. He says, you've helped make the first half of my tour fly by. Dave, that is unbelievably, unbelievably um, nice to hear. I, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I take stuff like that very seriously. I really do. That for people, and I've been lucky enough over the years to meet a few of you who've been deployed and using our show to get that connection back to home. And that's the kind of thing where I don't take it lightly. So on a day like this where stuff's just not going well, I better you know get my behind in here and do the best I can because – I want to be there for, for Dave in South Korea or, 
you know, truckers who got long haul trips to make or, you know, whatever else, uh, you know, I just, I just want to, um, uh, I just want to just, I want to be there and, um, and, and show up for you. And so I, I'm really happy. Uh, Barry Watkins says there's no dog stuff anywhere. So in the old studio, we had it decorated all the way around. We are sharing this studio, at least the intention is, we're going to share this studio a little bit more than the other one that we were in, just to be completely frank. We're going to, uh, we're going to share it a little more. So it's not really mine to decorate. The other studio is a, a good bit more mine to decorate, but this studio is not going to be mine to decorate quite as much. Uh, William Smith says, I never acknowledged the California dogs. William, I apologize for that. For those of you out there in the Golden State, we appreciate you being here. And if you're a, um, if you're a SoCal, uh, a Georgia fan, good luck to the Rams in the Super Bowl. I'm assuming you're a Rams fan, maybe you're a Chargers fan, but good luck to you. Uh, Crow King, why, why do y'all think it looks like a bathroom? Like, now it may be echoey a little bit because I don't have, you know, a regular microphone, but why does it look like a bathroom? Like, where are you even getting that from? Um, uh, BA's Natty Scarf, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Hassan says 15 and 0. So 12 and 0 is different than 15 and 0. Uh, is 15 and 0 in 2022 a given? I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not going to guarantee a national title as of yet. We got a whole off season to get through. But uh, is a 12 and 0 regular season more likely than not? I think that's a pretty interesting conversation. John Carter says anything lower than 11 and a half for a Georgia over under could be free money. And John, maybe you're right about that. Um. Senior Dog 54 says, have you, have you forgotten that we have our national championship winning quarterback back and you want to give the job to someone who's never taken a snap? Yeah, I think that you're making the conversation simpler than it has been there, or if, 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 at least if you're referencing me. You know, this is one of those things where I'm going to force nuance into the discussion. I think some people want things to be drawn, you know, broadly caricature, you know, far extreme on the one side, far extreme on the other, and – when it comes to stuff like this, I've got too much respect for my audience to treat you like this is cable news. You know, cable news wants to treat you like an idiot and, you know, they want to put things in the gr most grotesque extremes possible. When it comes to a subject like this in Georgia football, I just think we have the bandwidth to be more nuanced. Uh, you've heard me really give a lot of praise and credit justifiably for the year that Stetson Bennett had this season. I was doing that before it was cool to do but it was true then it remains true now that Stetson Bennett, I think had a very good year uh, for Georgia. And I'm not quite so sure they win the national championship without him. And in addition to that, I think that Georgia owes it to itself to have a competition to see if he is the best quarterback for this team upcoming this year. I think it's going to be hard to beat out Bennett given the way that he played a year ago, but I think young quarterbacks like Brock Vandegrift or Carson Beck, I think they deserve their chance. Maybe even Gunnar Stockton degree there as well. Um, I think they deserve their chance. And listen, if they don't beat him out, then maybe they push him to be even better than he was. And if in practice someone outperforms Bennett, then obviously you're not going to force that guy to sit simply because of the credentials that Bennett earned for himself in a previous season. That's just the way that it goes in football. You, you give credit for what has happened and you look to see what the best thing moving forward is. And, I think a spring practice that features a robust quarterback competition, I think it's going to be pretty interesting um, for sure. Um, William Perry, a little critical there of Stetson, but maybe some of that's true. Maybe some of it's not. I, I, don't, I, don't, quite, I don't quite know. I think the results speak for themselves. Um Jonathan Moore says, y'all know it kind of looks like a recording studio. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, this is, you think of it as a recording studio or just kind of a traditional radio studio. Like I said, it's a little smaller than the building we used to be in. And I got to get ready to go after this. But it's a little smaller than the building that we used to be in. Uh, but yeah, like I'll show you, like, you know, I got a microphone. You know, you see, well, you see what it looks like when I'm sitting here every single day. And through the glass, there's a regular control room. Um, in fact, I'll do this. Hold on. Y'all hang with me just for a second. So we're getting ready to go after this. So um, I kind of threw up my back a little bit this morning. So I'm a little bit, my back's hurting a little bit. So 
I'll come in here. Can you turn this off? So this is what this looks like. So here's this Michael. And he's going to get rid of the echo. So this is the board that we use every single day. So that's that's the uh, video board that we use. Here's the audio board that messed up us on here today. Connor wants to come on. That's the microphone he uses. But that's what it looks like in here. So that's that. So that's where we do the show from each and every day. All right. We got to go for now. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you being here. Um, hope you have a great day. And I will uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, hopefully the studio will be back and working in the way that's supposed to be. But appreciate you being here. R.S. Andrews Cool Down. Uh, Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And we will. Wally Smith said he heard a grunt. Yeah, I hurt my back. I hate it. Like, I never get sick. I never complain about anything physically. I just don't do it. But I, I hurt my. It's one of those things where, like, my back went out today and it hurt so bad. Oh my gosh, it hurt so bad. So uh, I am playing a little bit hurt today because of that. It happens to be probably twice a year. And I'm, I am embarrassed. I, I did grunt when I got up. And that makes me feel like such an old man. That embarrasses me so bad. But, um, but I am, uh, I'm going to struggle through it. And I will uh, see you all tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Hope you enjoyed a little impromptu tour of the studio. And hopefully all this stuff will work tomorrow. But we will talk to you then. <laughs>